All right, so we'll start. I know it, there may be some food coma, but um, we'll try to keep it as interesting as possible. Uh, Rahul, we have the next one and a half hours for this? One and a half hours, okay. So we'll also try to bring in, there was a lot of interesting questions that were asked right after the, uh, after the last session. Uh, I would encourage that if you, if you are still not clear, you could ask those questions again for the benefit of the audience as we go through those steps and um, some of those will become more clear anyways. Um, so we are going to now basically move into the, a little bit more theory and then we'll go more, go into the more um, practical side of things, although the full hands-on is um, for tomorrow. But what we'll try to do is essentially cover um, an introduction to Visor today in the later part of maybe later half an hour of this talk, right? And that'll actually make some of these things uh, quite clear in your mind. One of the things that I thought would be useful for you to imagine is that the backend data for what we are doing is a table, okay? Because what, what we have been discussing might um, look quite abstract. We are talking about nodes and edges and directed edges, but at the back end, how are we learning these nodes and edges are coming from a table, which is your good old friend. Essentially, you can imagine this to be patient one, patient two, patient three, patient 10, or uh, cell line one, cell line two, gene one, gene two, so, I mean, person one, person two, right? And these could be variables like um, the examples that we, <clears throat> that we were discussing. Uh, for example, we, there was an interesting question that came up that what if smoking causes star, causes lung cancer, right? But also there is uh, smoking, tar, lung cancer, but also there is pollution causing tar, causing lung cancer. So this is an interesting example. Thank you for bringing this up, where you're seeing the two effects converge right? This is a collider effect. As you can see, two causes leading to the same effect that is star accumulation. And then that leads to lung cancer, right? But now at the back end for this, this kind of uh, model is nothing but a data set that looks like this, which will have patient one smoking. It can be a binary yes, no, or it can be categorical 10 packs a day, five packs a day, 20 packs a day and so on, zero packs a day, okay? And then uh, let's say air pollution, let's say AQI, which could be a continuous number, location-based, where does this person spend most of his day, right? So AQI index, let's say 250, uh, let's say 30, 380 and so on. So you have such, and then there could be many other variables, right? Age of the person and so on, right? So we, how do we get from this kind of a good old table that we usually see to this kind of a model, which is quite sophisticated, which tells you that these are competing causes, intercausal reasoning. There's a smoking cause and a, a pollution cause, which both of which cause tar and which can cause lung cancer. And this can be learned from this data theoretically, right? If the data are great um, and represent the reality, you will learn this structure uh, from data. If people who are living in high AQI settings, they are followed up over such cohorts and the data are representative, you will see such kind of uh, uh, a structure emerge. More than that, you'll also see which one is more um, dominant in, in this, right? So that kind of inference, can also be made. And then you can also say, if I know that the pollution level is high, what can I infer about smoking and so on? If I remove tar, what can be? So, but the back end of this is this particular table and we will come to how do we learn uh, these. So, <clears throat> and the heart of this is essentially some, you, we can just basically start thinking about these uh, 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 phenomena as an extension of how to apply the Bayes rule with data, right? And although it has been discussed a couple of times, I think I'll just introduce a little bit more with an example uh, so that it becomes more clear. So Reverend Thomas Bayes, 
is basically seeing a person, although he's not a doctor, but he's seeing a person who has uh, presented with rashes on his face or her face, right? And then the question in his mind is whether it is chickenpox or is it smallpox, okay? In modern day, we don't have smallpox, but back then, this is a question that uh, let's imagine him, ask, him asking, right? As clinicians or even as biologists, these kind of questions are quite relevant and keep coming up. That you see, you see some data. Now these spots are data. Spots, yes, no, are data. And then you are basically trying to understand that uh, uh, what may be the model. Is the chicken pox the right model for the data or a small pox the right model, right? So how do you go? Let's see. Yeah, so what information do we have, right? So um, we, we have some back, background information that what is the probability, and this is what you may start with, right? That what is the probability of spots in smallpox? And what is the probability of spots in chickenpox? Probability of spots in smallpox is 90%. Probability of spots in chickenpox is 80%, right? Which makes us think that obviously this is a uh, higher number, right? So uh, if you are just a likelihood statistician, you're not Bayesian, you might start leaning towards this hypothesis of uh, smallpox, right? The data is that you have observed spots. But what Bayes rules also tell, rule also tells you is that when you hear hooves, think horses, not zebras, right? What is more prevalent? Horses or zebras? Horses are prevalent, right? So we need to, the crucial part of the equation that is missing at the, in the previous uh, um, equation or even this slide is basically the prevalence or what is called the prior probability of chicken pox and smallpox. So let's first discuss likelihood. This, this particular side of the equation, right? You all are aware of Bayes rule, which will come to uh, again, you, so that you will remember. But this side of the equation, which looks at spots given smallpox, this, this particular bar uh, uh, is, is basically pronounced as given. Spots given, conditional probability, that spots given smallpox is 90%. It is called likelihood of smallpox. Please do be aware of the confusion in language, right? It's spots given smallpox, it is called likelihood of smallpox. Okay, it's not likelihood of spots, okay? This is a likelihood approach, uh, likelihood side of the equation, right? So, and similarly, the spots given chicken pox is 80% is likelihood of chicken pox if we have, uh, if we have this data. For some reason, I think this is not working, but that's okay. Right, so the MLE, which is the maximum likelihood estimate in under such scenarios, which does not uh, consider the prevalence uh, in the data will come to a, it will lean towards the conclusion that since the likelihood of smallpox is higher than likelihood of chickenpox, the patient may be smallpox, right? And statistical models that work by, by maximizing the uh, likelihood uh, is, is of the model, right? Basically, uh, that's, that's called the maximum likelihood estimation. I'm not going into the mat mathematical uh, details, but it is very simple. Uh, uh, from that standpoint that most of, and it has a lot of value by itself um, in the real world as well, right? But the Bayes rule says that with the likelihood, which we just looked at, you also want to incorporate the prior probability, which should in be included with the Bayes rule. And then you achieve something called posterior probability, right? And the posterior probability is a, uh, is a multiplication of the likelihood and the prior, uh, and that's basically <coughs> the probability of disease given symptoms, right? So the likelihood is, likelihood estimate says probability of symptoms given disease, right? Posterior probability says probability of disease given symptoms. Now this flip is important. And now that we are aware of that there's this asymmetry of information in the real world that we discussed in the previous class in conditional probability, now you can understand that uh, these two are different, right? The likelihood is different from the posterior probability. There's a flip, right? And it's very clear that uh, these are different entities, okay? But um, why, I mean, there's, al there's always a 
conflict between the Bayesian and likelihood proponents, right? So the Bayesians say that, why do we even want to do this? I mean, as a, as a final outcome, right? We are interested in the inference, whether it is smallpox or chickenpox. We are not trying to infer whether it is spots uh, given chickenpox or spots given smallpox, right? So basically, our interest is in not in the spots, our interest is in the disease, right? So why do we maximize the estimate of something which is uh, not representing that particular thing, right? It's, 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 it's basically optimizing for the symptoms, it's not optimizing for the disease, okay? So that's the reasoning that Bayesians, um, Bayesian uh, probabilists actually give about why it's important to look at um, the other way around. And this actually forms the basis of machine learning, okay? Although it might seem like we are talking about Bayesian networks and so it's only applicable there, but the truth is that all machine learning is, um, um, is, is founded on, 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 on Bayes' rule because we are looking at, we, we are not optimizing for probability of data given hypothesis, but we are optimizing for probability of hypothesis given data. Okay, given data, we are trying to basically uh, uh, optimize for the hypothesis, right? So hypothesis here is the disease, data are the symptoms, okay? So that's the really direct way of uh, looking at it. So that's a simple calculation in the Bayes rule that you, uh, if you just take this on this side, right? It'll make complete sense because uh, if, you, if you just, that, that can be left as a homework. If you drew the Venn diagrams, right? If you just took that on the other side, you'll see that both are the same. That's a simple derivation of the Bayes rule. So probability of smallpox given spots multiplied by probability of spots will be equal to the probability of spots given smallpox multiplied by the probability of smallpox, right? So uh, that is the famous uh, Bayes, uh, uh, Bayes rule. So this side of the things, the first one is essentially uh, likelihood, as we discussed before. This is a prior. We also discussed this. This term we have not discussed so far. It is the probability of spots. This is sometimes also called as evidence. Essentially, uh, spots can happen due to many, many, many diseases, right? Even uh, non-infectious uh, diseases. So basically, we want to normalize that what is the probability of seeing the data by itself? Because it's not just chickenpox and smallpox that will give you spots. It can be many other reasons that can, uh, that can lead to a rash. And you want to basically have a normalizing factor in the denominator. And this is the most tricky part of the equation because how do you integrate? How do you account for some things that you don't even know? We know smallpox and chickenpox. So this usually uh, creates the most mischief in the calculation of the uh, posteriors. And that is the reason why Bayesian probability, even though being so intuitive, so natural, wasn't used until computation um, uh, basically became um, uh, inexpensive, less expensive, I would say. And we were able to calculate this denominator of the equation, okay? Because this requires a huge amount of simulations, Monte Carlo and Gibbs sampling and so on uh, to actually calculate the denominator. Right? That is the reason, because it may be coming to your mind, why is Bayesian statistics not taught, let's say, in, um, in, in standard curriculum, even though we are taught Bayes rule, but uh, learning st Bayesian statistics is slightly more, it, it, it requires more computational finesse. So uh, essentially, this is just in our code. You can go back and uh, implement on your own that there's, there's some prior probabilities of smallpox and prior probabilities, and then you can actually get the posterior probability. Okay, that is represented here. <clears throat> Again, some mathematical uh, nota notation. So chicken pox, theta C, smallpox, theta S, symptoms X, right? <coughs> so basically, theta is your hypothesis. It's just a, a mathematical way of representing things. Right? So essentially, uh, you are using the symptoms in the Bayes rule, theta C given X, which is your data, Right, and the posterior probability is given by theta c, which is here is chickenpox is 98%. If you do the calculation, if you account for the prior probability of chickenpox into account, there's a posterior probability of smallpox is only uh, 1%, okay? So which tells you, uh, one, uh, yeah, so basically which tells you that the prior here 
played a major role because again when you hear uh, ho uh, hooves think zebras and not uh, think horses and not zebras right so essentially the prior probability of uh, uh, chicken pox was already so high that it has now completely shifted the posterior towards chicken pox okay so this is again uh, many times we forget and a very famous example used is um, if you if you are sitting and you are a machine learning scientist right if you are given an, a chest radiograph a mammogram actually and you observe a nodule in the breast it's a female mammogram in the breast what is the probability of breast cancer in that uh, in in that uh, uh, female given that um, there is a nodule that is visible in chest mammograms in 98% of uh, females with breast cancer so this is the information let me repeat it for you facts 98% of the females with breast cancer will have a nodule on a chest mammogram fact number 1 okay fact number 2 you see a nodule in the mammogram right so we may be led to believe and tell that this is uh, this this uh, mammogram is actually uh, is a case of breast cancer which is not the case because remember we can't flip these uh, two sides right breast cancer is a disease and then we have mammogram positive um, as a sign or a or a or a uh, finding right so that's a positive right so breast cancer given mammogram is different from mammogram given best breast cancer why because in this we are studying the population because given breast cancer means we are studying the population of women who had breast cancer and in those 98% had a nodule so this conditional probability the population is important whereas here mammogram is not done only for breast cancer uh, right it, um, breast cancer patients it can be done it can be a normal mammogram also so your population background population is much higher all females will have undergone mammogram right and then what is the um, uh, in that population what is the probability of breast cancer and that is a different number that probability is quite low so and many times even expert radiologists have actually made this mistake by giving in, giving an interpretation that uh, uh, this may be a diagnosis of breast cancer that's why we say clinically correlate right the probability of breast cancer itself is so low when you multiply that with the finding the uh, the probability of uh, uh, breast cancer given that finding actually comes out to be lower all right so it is not 98% you have a question ex ex x is the symptoms right great question so i think that's the data so how are we calculating so that's uh, that's what i was saying here that in this equation the probability of spots is px symptom is px from, right it's from, yeah from the data how uh, we are calculating because so you can conduct a survey for example okay so in for example even in this class you can actually go around and look at how many uh, what is the probability of spots right so that background probability of spots in the population it's a different uh, it's a different uh, uh, calculation from what we are doing uh, doing there in base rule actually theta s and theta c that should be mutually exclusive and exhaustive also so here we are not considering that thing yes no so you yeah, are absolutely so thank you for highlighting that um, that assumption that they have to be uh, mutually exclusive right so it's just steve also yeah so we 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 are we are taking only the simple case where they are mutually exclusive okay so you said how do we calculate this right so this is as i said earlier this is not a straightforward thing to do because you have to uh, conduct simulations like monte carlo simulations to actually estimate what is the underlying space in the real world situations and that's but what you can do is you can actually calculate something called a bayes factor and you can just uh, if you have two competing hypotheses you can actually estimate if you had competing hypothesis you can estimate which hypothesis is favoring is being favored more because then this term will cancel out okay if i take a 
ratio of the competing hypothesis, and I'll come to that. In that case, this will cancel out. That's what used to be done earlier, but now you will conduct GIP sampling and other sampling strategies to actually estimate this uh, denominator, which is the difficult side of the thing. <coughs> yeah, so that's exactly what we are discussing, we were discussing right now. And that is called the maximum a posteriori estimate. Given two competing hypotheses, which, has, which hypothesis do I prefer? Which is a different question from the likelihood um, approach, right? So I will, I will prefer the hypothesis uh, which will basically maximize the, the ratio, okay? So you will have, a, uh, you'll have, a prob you'll have this equation for smallpox and for chickenpox, you'll see that this will cancel out, right? And the map will either be more than one or less than one, and that can be used to choose the right model, okay? So that is basically the basis for maximizing your uh, uh, posterior probability uh, by looking at these ratios, and that, that can be done simply, okay? So again, to recapitulate, uh, theta hypothesis given data is data given hypothesis multiplied by probability of hypothesis divided by probability of data, right? That is the succinct notation. Uh, we've already discussed this, that something that canceled out uh, can be ignored, right? And then these two, these terms only remain, the ratio of priors and the ratios of likelihood. And these can be used to, uh, uh, to choose the best, the right model out of the two, the, the right hypothesis out of the two. Okay. And um, as again, you will say that this is a posterior odds. Why odds now? Because now you're taking a ratio. It's not a posterior probability. Just like odds ratio, it is a posterior odds. It's not a posterior probability because it's a ratio of these two things, which is nothing but a multiplication of your likelihood ratio, right? You can see that X given theta C, X given theta S. These are the ratios. These are the likelihoods, uh, the ratio of the likelihoods. And then you have the prior odds, right? What are the odds, prior odds of chicken pox and smallpox, right? And the term that got canceled out was evidence or marginal likelihood, which we discussed was always the mischievous factor uh, to be computed. All right, so we choose the, uh, as, as, a, as an example that we were doing earlier, basically we, we get something like 88.9 in that case. Right, so a posterior odds greater than three or less than one by three is usually considered strongly indicative, okay? This is just a thumb rule. Uh, in this case, strongly indicative towards chicken pox. Okay, so I think I'll just play a video here. Uh, I don't know if there's volume that you can hear. Um, if not, you can just click this link, but um, let me see. Yeah, let me see if I can. It sounds like four candles. So he's asking for handles for folks and it goes on, it goes a long way. So it's a seven minute video, which you can watch. So uh, essentially our priors are continuously shaping our perception, right? When the guy is listening for candles because he's not used to listen to that uh, accent of four candles, right? So essentially this is the way we also make decisions in clinical settings we also make such kind of uh, decisions in our daily. So our priors shape how we uh, decide and how we go forward in the, in the real world, right? So essentially this is um, just an indication that our machine learning systems also need to take this into account. Another clinical example is that if you see a patient with a swollen leg in Delhi versus a patient with a swollen leg in Orissa, for example, now it has changed, but 30, 40 years back, Filariasis would be your prior um, probability in Orissa, right? In Delhi, it might be heart failure, kidney failure, right? Because, because as a clinician, 
you are as an epidemiologist or as a uh, 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 somebody who's doing research, you would have, have right away have a prior probability. This, this particular disease is more prevalent in this state. So this patient must be that, right? That's how we work. But our machine learning systems, do they take this into account? They don't. That is where we basically uh, uh, bring in this Bayes rule uh, to, to incorporate that into our modeling, right? So four candles versus four candles, uh, acoustic data going in. So which basically brings us to the Bayesian networks, which you already discussed. So the, the steps. So what we will do now, I think we, uh, we have an hour to go. What we'll do now is essentially go through some of these practical aspects of, um, uh, of learning Bayesian networks from data. As you would have tabular data sets, um, you would also want to uh, uh, learn the network with your data. What I will be doing is I will leave the hands on for you and working with you tomorrow. I'll just give an overview of what and how this will be done, okay? So the key steps in, um, in the Bayesian network approach are first learning the structure and second validating the structure and third conducting inference, okay? So I would actually want to switch. So let's see if we can. If it switch or not. Okay, it does switch, but. So by the way, I think this is the. Okay, two eight eight nine. Yeah, so this is currently running on my local machine. And this is how the interface actually looks like, right? So you uh, can directly go to start analyzing, all right? So there's some settings that you can change in this. For example, my, my system, I have not installed the Snow or cluster package as of now, but you're working in, if you're working in a, a, a multi-core system, right? Or if you have clusters, you can actually change it to, uh, uh, you, you can change this number to enable parallel computing. Why parallel computing? Because learning Bayesian network structure from data is an expensive exercise um, in terms of computation, not as expensive as, uh, expensive as uh, transformer models, which are the basis of the large language models these days. But still, it is uh, more expensive than, for example, doing simple uh, models, support vector machine, random forest, et cetera. So, so sometimes you might want, for example, uh, stronger inference and then you can do multi-core computing and we'll come to that, okay? Uh, so what do I mean by learning structure? So learning structure means that you had a table like this and you want to come to a structure that looks like this. This is, this diagram is here is called this, uh, uh, this is called a structure of data, right? It's called this exercise is called structure learning. And structure learning is basically, um, subfield in itself, because it's not just Bayesian network learning. Structure learning can also happen through graph neural networks. So learning the representation of data in the form of a network, which is a directed acyclic graph is called structure learning. It's a common thing that is, uh, it's a common name uh, that we use for all these different types of approaches. Uh, Bayesian networks is one of them, okay? So, as we can see in the, uh, as we can see on the slide, we first learn structure, which has a couple of approaches, and you'll see in the in the software also how does it how does it work. <laughs> By the way, the software is just a wrapper. Okay, it's a it's a convenient wrapper around I think more than two hundred packages that we have integrated uh, within R. So. Um, because when we started out in Bayesian network, I'll show you some examples in the, in the seminar talk. It was very tedious to really conduct these analysis and then change something and then basically go back. So for our own purpose, actually, we started writing this software and then we thought it's useful and then we made it open uh, generally uh, to the world, but it's just a convenient wrapper, okay? You can do all of this if you wanted to 
uh, completely in terminal uh, using the packages that uh, we have listed in the uh, documentation and you'll get the same results and you'll achieve the same thing. Maybe obviously you'll not be able to visualize uh, what we will see uh, in the package, but, uh, but uh, mathematically you'll get the same result, okay? So learning structure happens through two ways. One is core based and the second is constraint based. Let me spend some time here to help you uh, what does it, understand what does it mean. So we had a question right after lunch that how do we decide that the direction should be this and not this, right? So from data, let's say we were starting from that table, how do we decide that this is the right direction and not this? Any thoughts? Yep. Let's say we didn't have temporal data. You only had static data, right? Literature, okay. So that you're saying that, uh, okay. So that is domain-based, prior knowledge-based understanding that you can say that this node uh, affects this node. That is literature. But you have mm, thousands, tens of thousands of variables, sometimes millions of SNPs. You're learning from data, sorry. How? Yes. You have a conditional probability. Remember the aspirin and the coronary artery disease example? Whichever is higher, <laughs> uh, you can, you, which one influences more with the, uh, the flow of influences more that can be used to do that, right? So that way, which started with looking at these pairwise, imagine you have 10,000 nodes in your network, 10,000 choose two pairs of tests that you will do right? That approach was called constraint-based approach, right? Where you will start with a node, you pick some node and then basically start expanding from there and then you'll uh, go from here to here and here to here and here to here and so on. But now you can see very clearly, right? There's two things. One, it is very expensive to conduct these many um, uh, tests. And also, what did we do? Basically, we looked at, uh, <coughs> uh, we looked at simpler things like Fisher's uh, test if we were doing a um, two by two table or chi-square test, if we're doing a three by, uh, if, if it was more than two by two, right? And the reason is that uh, why fishes and chi-square? Because these are non-parametric tests. So inherently it can take into account the non-parametric um, um, uh, tests and then basically doesn't enforce the assumption of linearity in your in your data, right? So, but the challenge here is that this, if you choose a wrong step to start with, it'll percol, it'll basically propagate, right? The error propagation will be too high. So these approaches were abandoned. However, having said that, some of the most famous approaches in causality is an algorithm called PC algorithm, okay? Um, Clark, same with Clark and P, I'm forgetting. So if anybody remembers, please tell me. PC algorithm has been one of the most famous algorithm for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for causal structure learning, and it took a uh, it took a constraint based approach. But at that time, these networks used to be networks used to be small. Uh, there were there weren't too many variables. Now we are dealing with maybe uh, many many more variables. So these these have lost uh, their popularity. The score based algorithms, which is uh, mentioned here, right? Those are algorithms which do not look at such pairwise tests. Okay, they don't look at such pairwise tests. How do they work? Now, again, that's a very computer, I mean, it used to be the state of the art challenge in computational, in computer science that it's called learning the equivalence class of networks that will produce this data. Okay, using optimization algorithms, we don't learn edge by edge, we don't learn edge by edge. We say there are about, uh, let's say a hundred different probabilities of, uh, sorry, a hundred different structures that could have generated this data, okay? So which one, which structure is the most likely structure to have generated this data? But usually it's not only hundreds, it's actually this, the space is uh, too large. Un unless we actually constrain the space with some assumptions, okay? So, and that is where I think the computer science 
uh, Advances and Daphne Collins work, the book that I uh, referred to earlier, uh, was, um, um, they, their work was crucial that you don't need to look through all the possible structures, but you can reduce the number of structures by a huge uh, amount. And then only you can, the, only then you can look at the uh, possible structures, right? So, and then you achieve something which is as a whole, as a complete model fitting this data, okay? Basically, we are not trying to build the network node edge, node edge, node edge, but we are saying that these kind of different structures are possible. Which one of those structures is most likely to explain this data, to give this data as a model? Okay, and those are called score-based algorithms. We keep a score to, uh, to assess the model, and that's why it's a Bayesian approach, right? Basically, we keep a score to look at the best possible structure. It's a com that's why it is a very computationally expensive exercise. Uh, there are two types of scores that you can use. And Rahul had mentioned um, in his earlier talk as well, AIC and BIC, okay? Akai K information criteria and the Bayesian information criteria, BIC. And um, uh, these two approaches have their own usefulness. In Bayesian networks, we, if we want the network to be sparse, which means that's usually true for the BIC. If you want a network which has smaller number of edges, is simpler, we prefer the BIC, okay? But uh, sometimes AIC gives you a more um, complete picture, okay? The, as um, Rahul was also mentioning the parsimony uh, principle, by parsimony principle, we prefer the BIC over AIC usually, okay? Now you have learned this structure. But is this structure really uh, useful? So let's see how would you do this practically. Let me switch to Visor window. I'm going to just upload a data set. So Visor comes preloaded with some data sets, okay? So here, as you can see, there's a data set called Alarm, which is a data from ICUs, okay? <coughs> it's not our data, but it's an ICU data set. Um, and then there's some other data sets also. So People who are familiar with R will know that you have to actually, uh, if you know that your variables are all factor variables, factors are, it's a special type of uh, uh, categorical uh, variable class, then you can check this. If not, in that case, you, uh, you can just remove this check, okay? You can browse and you can load your own data and start working with that. But here I'm, only, I'm actually going to load the alarm data, which is an example data. And let me just give you a basic understanding of what it, what it has. So CVP is central venous pressure, TPR is total peripheral resistance, BP is blood pressure, cardiac output, uh, HRBP, SAO2 is uh, uh, arterial uh, oxygen saturation and so on. So clinicians and this is flow of oxygen, right? So it looks very much like uh, an ICU data set where monitoring is happening. But, a feature of this data you can see is that it has actually been converted into a factor data, okay? Which means that instead of having blood pressure as 120, it says blood pressure is uh, normal or low or high, okay? It has created these categories which are factor categories. Now, the question obviously would be that can you not work with data that has continuous variables? You can, okay? So uh, in Visor, we have kept uh, continuous data to be discretized into discrete classes, but if you go to the base R uh, and the package uh, in the base R, which is one of the best packages, uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll be able to work with all types of data, okay? So you can explore your data to see, for example, what are the distributions, right? This is what we do usually in, um, in, in statistics, right? We visualize our data. What is, the, what is the distribution of central venous pressure? So in this ICU, for example, most of the patients are in the 72%, uh, uh, most of the patients, I mean 72% probability is patients uh, having normal central venous pressure, okay? And only 1% probability, sorry, 11% probability that their CVP was low, 15% probability that the CVP was high. These are just prevalences, right? So priors, as we, as we know, right? So essentially, these are just background probabilities of what does, what does the CVP look like? Or let's say blood pressure look like, right? So 
So you can see that <coughs> in the ICU, this particular ICU, there's a higher probability of having high or low blood pressure, right? And uh, intensive care physicians would recognize that low probability of, uh, sorry, low blood pressure uh, is a common thing that happens in the ICUs. It is associated with shock and uh, critical outcomes and so on. So we want to basically learn with these kind of variables, a network that will help us achieve um, some decisions. There's also some things that you can do with your data, which in the hands-on tomorrow, you can uh, take in more detail. So for example, um, if, your, if your data were predominantly numeric, you can import your data as numeric and then maybe convert the few variables that you wanted to convert into a factor or vice versa. A most important thing is how do you deal with missing data, right? So most of these real world data sets would, would, have, would, have, uh, would have missingness associated with it, right? So uh, these, these algorithms, they do not work with missing data. So we have built imputation strategies. The strategy that we use here is based upon random forest models and uh, it would basically impute the data. But our recommendation is do not impute data, uh, remove the variables which are more than 10% missing in your data, okay? And then there's discretization because you uh, would like to say if this is low, what happens uh, to the other variables? So basically creating classes like low, medium, high, and so on, which we'll learn about tomorrow. You can delete and specify interventions. Specification of interventions is important when you have a causal learning setup, okay? Only when you have a certain intervention, for example, you gave a drug and then you wanted to see the causal effect of that. Then you will say that I have a causal, I have a intervention variable in the, in the network, okay? Otherwise you will usually have network which does not have interventions because many, most of our data are usually observational data in nature. Unless you're doing a clinical trial, but then you don't need a Bayesian network, right? So, <coughs> all right. So we'll go to structure learning and since it's slightly complex, I'll just um, be slow in this. So you click on this structure learning tab and the first thing you see here is initialize structure, which is optional, right? So somebody said, you said that you can actually specify this from domain understanding. You can actually start with a domain understanding with an initialized structure and build on top of it using your data. Mostly we don't have this. So we go to the next one, which is learn structure. Sometimes you've already learned structure, the example that I gave that you learned a model on AIMS, now you want to take it to a Saptajang sub hospital, right? You can also start from a pre-trained model, which is a pre-learned structure, okay? And it also gives you the option of editing structure, which is after learning structure, okay? So let's start with the first thing first, learn structure. And here basically you see that there are Again, different approach, there are different parameters that are specified here. The learning algorithms, hill climbing, and you'll see the most favored algorithms that we have found and all not just us, but favored in the literature algorithm. We have said that these are recommended algorithms, okay? Hill climbing is an optimization algorithm that, as I said, will look for which is the structure that fits this data best, right? And basically it, it is look, it just like you do a gradient descent, you have a question? No, okay. So uh, it'll basically uh, 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 do a gradient based search and it's, it's recommended for score based learning. Similarly, we have a tabulated search learning where you have a lookup table at how did this structure perform maybe 20 iterations back and can we actually, uh, was that the better structure so that it doesn't forget as it is learning, okay? So uh, these are the options. And then there's also the constraint-based algorithms which you do not recommend, but you can try. So let's just go here. And for the heck of it right now, just forget about everything else and just click on one time. 
you see it's, it did not take a long time. It says structure learning complete. And something like, like this shows up, <clears throat> right? Remember, we did not give any prior information to the model other than the data that was there. You can zoom in and look at some of the nodes. What are these, right? So, and you can see a structure that comes up here, right? You can, can somebody identify what structure is this? Collider structure, blood pressure, having a uh, intercausal effect between from cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. Now, this is to a clinician in the ICU a no brainer because blood pressure depends upon cardiac output, which means how much volume of the blood is being pumped out of the heart and what is the total peripheral resistance. Because it's not only important that how much blood volume is being pumped out, it's also important what is the resistance of our vessels in the periphery, right? If the vessels are dilated, whatever blood is pumped out is not going to create pressure in the, in the periphery, right? So it's the um, it's a simple pressure volume law, okay? So now you can see that it learned this structure from data directly, right? We did not give any prior understanding. We just gave this kind of a table, right? And it learned the structure of the, um, uh, of the, of the influences, which, which show that blood pressure is, uh, uh, is affected by both cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, all right? This is what is called the one-time learning. Right? We call it one-time. One I mean, I'm not so confident about this structure because I've just run it once, right? So what if I did a bootstrap? Bootstrap is an approach where you sample the data with replacement <coughs> and then you learn the model, okay? And since every time a slightly different sample will be observed, you will see a slightly different model every time. Right? That is called bootstrapping. It's a famous bootstrap paper by F Brad Efron from Stanford. So essentially what we can do is we can go back. Now you can actually, sorry. Going to, so you can see here, there is uh, there are some options, right? So we didn't go through all these options. You can see BIC, scoring criteria, AIC scoring criteria, et cetera, right? Um, I'll also introduce this as blacklist. Blacklist means that if some things cannot happen in the real world, things not going back in time. So you can actually create a blacklist. You can browse it or you can actually create a blacklist by forcing or prohibiting edges. Whitelisting means the opposite, that if you all, if you know that this will happen, these two relationships, this relationship should exist with this direction, then you can whitelist it. It'll take that into account. It's again a way of incorporating prior knowledge, domain knowledge into your learning, all right? So, <clears throat> so we'll just do 11 bootstraps. I usually recommend odd numbers so that we can do a majority voting. If six out of 11 say there is an edge in the direction, then we consider it, right? But you can choose any number. You can choose higher number. In our papers, we do about, we do anywhere between 301 to 501 to 1001 bootstraps to give us more confidence. For the purpose, I mean, because it takes some time, I'm going to do 11 bootstraps. I'm going to say 51%. Again, this is a parameter which is in, under your control. 51% here means majority voting. That if the majority of these 11 networks say that an edge is present, I will consider it. And the direction is again, the direction indicated by the majority of these. <clears throat> so basically um, these are um, edge strength and direction confidence. And we run it again, we call it boot, we, we say bootstrap. <coughs> now it will run for a slightly longer time. As you can see, learning network structure, So now you can see that the structure that comes up is sparser. I did not save the previous structure, which if I loaded, you will see that that was more dense, but you can just go here and you can save the bootstrap or the, uh, 
one time structure and you'll see that this is a network. So 11 uh, bootstraps also give us this particular finding, right? And now you can actually hover over this edge and it gives you the number of times probability that this edge exists, right? 100% of those 11 networks said that this edge exists, okay? Similarly here, you have 100% of the network saying that, right? So since it's a small number, I might not see a lot of granularity, but let's see, this is also, so here, for example, is 63% only, right? So this is, uh, let's look at this edge. This edge is about king, king, king of a tube and, and some valve. I'm not sure what exactly this variable is, but kinking of a tube and valve, uh, a certain uh, valve, right? And so you can see that the probability of this edge is not 100%. Not all 11 networks said that this is having a strong uh, uh, probabilistic association, right? So that, that slightly answers the question earlier from earlier that how do you decide which is more important? You can look at these numbers from bootstraps to get a sense of if I did this a thousand times, how many times did I get this edge, right? So it will give you uh, a way to actually query the right uh, variables, okay? But you can see that the previous um, uh, model that we, the previous question that we were looking at, <clears throat> cardiac output, blood pressure. So blood pressure being influenced by both cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, right? So this has, almost 100, this has 100% confidence in this particular run from both the sides. So this is basically validating the structure computationally. Okay. Of course, you can validate this structure under experimental uh, uh, situations also. You can actually say, okay, let's, let me go back to the lab, or uh, tweak this gene, right? And let me see if that changes the uh, changes the effect of, on the other gene downstream or not, right? That's, that's the uh, experimental validation side of things. But here we just are validating it computationally by, by, by doing bootstraps. Question so far? Yes. Hello. Uh, so sir, in the starting, you said that we are using the hill climbing algorithm. Then how bootstrapping, applying bootstrapping multiple times is giving us a better structure if we are using the, using the same algorithm? That's a great question. So your question, yeah. So if you're using, you no, know, so bootstrapping is a statistical approach, right? Hill climbing is, a, is an optimization approach. So every run of hill climbing, if you are taking a bootstrap may not give the same uh, structure. So you're absolutely right. We could actually bootstrap using different algorithms also. But that will be obviously slightly more computationally expensive, but you can take a consensus network. You can, you can learn a hill climbing based structure. You can even take a tabulated search based structure or even a score based. And then you can take a consensus of those uh, structures, which is not usually recommended, but you could do that, right? Because not recommended to mix the constraint and the score based algorithm. What you could do more in a, in, in a better manner is, is you could mix the score-based algorithms within, within themselves. For example, a tabulated search and hill climbing. The hill climbing algorithm, uh, first of all, by itself is not deterministic, right? And now we are bootstrapping on top of that, which means that we are learning the network structure using a subset of the data every time in those 11 times. So the hill climbing algorithm itself will also give some slightly different structures. And not every structure will be the same. We can then take a vote. But that question is very important because that's a philosophical question actually, where the debate about equivalence class of um, uh, Bayesian network actually is, is, is centered around uh, that um, it's extremely difficult to get to the, to the perfect right structure. We can only get to something called an equivalence class of networks, okay? But I'll not go into that. Uh, can, uh, you can refer to Daphne Coller's book or uh, I think that Neil Friedman's book is the best for that. So we can only get to an equivalence class of network. We can't exactly point out that this is the best network. 
there will be other networks which are in the equivalence class of this particular network and they'll be equally valid, right? But that's not a topic of, I mean, we, that's a little advanced. So, uh, but I hope I answered your question that you could still do a consensus voting of networks that can be learned from different algorithms. Here we are doing a consensus voting from the point. Any other questions? Yes. In this score based uh, method, you mentioned that the structure is built to best fit the data that we have, right? How exactly is the st uh, structure built? I mean, I understand the algorithm is doing something, but I'm not able to understand how the structure is being built. Does the algorithm already have number of templates to choose from, or it's checking all the possible combinations? I'm that's Yeah, sure. that's correct. So it's basically, as I said earlier, uh, if you are given 10 nodes, right, 10 variables, you can have all possible combinations of stru network structures. There may be tens of thousands of lakhs, right? That that um, that can be built using that particular table, right? So if I have three, um, if I have three variables, variable one, variable two, variable three, from this table, right? So there can be, as as we discussed before, right? There can be those three structures that we discussed all possible combinations using variable one, variable two, variable three. Now you start adding variables, variable, variable four and then variable, let's say up to 10. These structures will, the number of structures will explode, right? The more variables you add, the number of structures will get, get exponentially large. We do not, I mean, so the, the, um, the theoretical way is that you have to enumerate each of these structures. Each of the possible structures that are possible with uh, this kind of data, you have to enumerate. And then see which one did which uh, which structure explained the data the best. That's not possible. That is a challenge. Uh, that is a computer science challenge. That's not possible to be computed. Uh, it is an NP hard problem. Actually, it's an NP complete problem. So, uh, but what uh, led to the and again that was a Daphne Collar and Neil Friedman work that led to this uh, uh, change was they showed that you don't have to actually look at all the possible structures. There, the space, this learning space can be constrained. And that's where I think uh, you'll have to go back to the paper and read how, how the space is constrained, how the real world constraints come in so that you don't look at those millions and trillions of possible network combinations. That's why it is also expensive to learn. Although in the small network you saw that it's in, within 30 seconds, it actually learned by 11. But if you go to larger variable data sets, it'll sometimes take days to run, okay? So, because it has to look at all those possible uh, right combinations. And some statistical, for example, sanitization uh, helps you get to the point where you are reducing those number of combinations, right? So, but you can easily understand from the three node situation that all possible structures can be checked for what gave that data, okay? The value you have shown uh, in this interactive uh, network uh, in the arrow. So is that a conditional probability or just a proportion of uh, means scoring or something? Great question. It's a proportion of, it's a majority. So for each bootstrap, yeah. for every bootstrap, you will have a either yes, no kind of thing. Correct. Uh, so it's a majority value of uh, those. 63% uh... of networks, we took okay. 11 networks here. Okay. 63% so of 11, whatever that number is, said that this edge is present. Okay. It's not a condition probability, okay? Okay, so if we don't, if we forget about the bootstrapping yeah. and just run this thing for a one time. Yeah. And so there we are deciding these, uh, 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 these arrows based on the, maximum conditional probability right yep. so whether given that uh, given first node uh, uh, for the second node or second node given first node so for example uh, uh, for the first That's node we do it right we just discussed that i mean so it is an easy way to think about it that we build okay. the network node by node given first node second yeah. build it but we don't learn the network like that 
Okay. Because that's where the constraint based algorithms come in mm -hmm. and they lead to a lot of errors because if you choose the right wrong node to start with, yeah. your error propagation will be too high, right? So you don't want to really go node by node and conduct Fisher test or a chi-square test mm -hmm. and keep building the network from there. You want to fit the entire structure okay. which fits the data. Okay. Right? Yeah, thank so, you. Yeah, so it's again, that is also not a conditional probability based approach. What you will get yeah. is conditional probability and that I'll come to later. Okay. What you will get is conditional probability. Okay. But while learning the model, we have not learned the model through a conditional probability approach. Although that is an easier approach to think about and write to start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you will get conditional probabilities when we come to uh, yeah, this inference. Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll learn more about that. Yeah, you had a question? You will be surprised when you, because I, when I basically started using these, I also had the same kind of questions, right? But you'll be surprised how well, if your data are good, how well, at least the, the basic structures, you'll see how well they, they are captured. We have multiple examples, multiple papers, public health and clinical that, that talk about this. But uh, I understand your uh, apprehension, which is very valid. You should be apprehensive. We were discussing over lunch that there's no model that's that's correct, absolutely right. That's famous boxes um, uh, statement that all models are wrong. Some models are useful, so you will you will see that no model is going to be perfect. This is just a way to make the models more explainable, right? And essentially, uh, so that you can also look at them and and sanitize the models, right? So you may find that the model learned something which completely doesn't make sense. In that case, you can go back to uh, <clears throat> structure learning and actually sanitize the model by saying edit structure. You can edit it. If you think that this is implausible, you can edit it and then retrain it. Some people think about that as a bug, that why should we allow, we learn the structure and then we allow it to be changed we think about that as a feature, right? Because all other models don't have this kind of, um, uh, all other models are also flawed, just like this model, but they don't have this kind of um, uh, uh, functionality or a feature built in that we can actually uh, start iterating with models. What does uh, this create is a lot of subjective interpretation sometimes. And you can think of that as good or bad. And this is just one approach. We also use this as one of the approaches. This is not the only approach that exists out there. It's one of my favorites because being a clinician, I like to see first, change things and look at how things are. And I'm mostly surprised. In most of the situations, I actually am surprised pleasantly that it actually captures the, uh, the, the reasonable uh, influences, but not just capture, but then quantifies them and also extends those. But the disclaimer is you will have to engage and interact with the model. Think about that interaction with the model as a feature and not a bug. Because other models also suffer the same things, but they don't allow that kind of interactivity. So, uh, so my, my short answer to that question is, you will have to play with the model. You will have to visually explore the model, look at it, right? and then see if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, basically then uh, you can edit it or discard it completely. Um, <clears throat> that's why it is, it is in, in, uh, we call it explainable AI. So any other questions? Thank you for that question. <clears throat> so um, these, as I said earlier, these class of models are called representation learning models. 
right? They are not a supervised approach where we are optimizing for a given uh, outcome, like predict whether this patient is sepsis or non-sepsis. Although you can do that from this model, right? But it is not built to optimize for that particular. It is a general purpose model, which gives you a representation. So the way we typically use this model in the real world are this in combination with the supervised model, okay? And that's not something that is unique to this. We have been doing this for a long time before language models came in, but language models do that the same, I mean, do, do the same. A pre-trained transformer, GPT, right? General purpose uh, pre-trained transformer, pre-trained on Wikipedia data set, can now be retuned for uh, biological data sets, right? Bio GPT came out, for example, similarly clinical GPT and so on. So these class of models are called representation learning models, which don't capture uh, a certain uh, outcome in particular, but they capture the representation of the data. What is the representation? The joint probability, right? So essentially what are we doing here? We are actually calculating the probability, the multivariate probability distribution, right? Which can then be factored into conditional probabilities, right? This complete table here, the, the complete table, the probability distribution over complete table is what we are trying to capture, which can then be factored into these individual conditional probabilities, right? So S given uh, smoking, given AQI, cancer given AQI and so on. Those relationships are factored from the joint probability and the challenge, the computational challenge or the advances are to actually to capture the joint and the factored probabilities in the best possible manner. Marginal probabilities and, and the joint probability together. And that is what is called the representation learning. What does it allow you to do? It actually allows you to learn the representation of the data and the distribution of the data from which you can actually sample from. What does that mean? You can generate new data. Just like chat GPT can generate new language, you can actually generate new data. That is why these are called generative modeling approaches. Alok who is sitting here works on generative models for genomics data sets, uh, gene expression data sets. We have not yet published, but uh, we are seeing some very good outcomes with, with generated data. We see something similar in clinical data sets. So, but the bottom line is that these representation learning models learn a probability distribution from which you can actually sample and generate new data, just like chat GPT generates new data. That's actually the topic of my next uh, talk, which is generative models in um, healthcare. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I wanted to understand how the type of data, sorry, the type of data that goes into the model influences the networks, as in whether you have a static <coughs> cross-sectional data set versus longitudinal, whether when you measure the patient multiple times, and cases where there are mixed data? That's a great question. So what I'm showing right now is just a static Bayesian network, which assumes independence between patients. Okay, so it is not a mixed uh, effects design. So we are assuming, thank you for asking that, we are assuming that uh, these are independent samples, which may not hold true. If you have longitudinal data, you have a couple of options. You can make time a variable. Okay, in, 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 in this kind of uh, setting. We are also coming out soon. Actually, we've already uh, put on GitHub, but we are just testing it, beta testing it, something called dynamic Bayesian networks, which allow you to fold uh, the network, unfold the network over time actually, right? So that is something that we have just built as a package and uh, we'll be releasing that. But this is just static data assuming there's no longitudinal repeated measurements for the same patient, okay? So study design is very important. This is mostly cross-sectional study design or at most like a clinical trial design where you'll have an intervention variable. Thank you for that question. Absolutely, yes. So, um, so
So they're, they're actually formally used for something called feature selection using Markov blankets. So every node here um, has something called a Markov blanket, which is the blanket of nodes, which are its parents, children, and siblings. Okay. For example, feature selection is a problem which we usually, importance is a problem which we usually see when we, uh, when we're doing supervised learning, right? If I have to predict uh, shock, non-shock, which features should I select? You'll have to actually look at the region of the network where that shock variable is. For example, stroke volume, right? So stroke volume, and then you look at cardiac output, and then you look at whatever this is, right? So these features are definitely in the Markov blanket of stroke volume. Right? So parents, children, and sibling, siblings are the first order mark of blanket that you can use. So this approach has been formally used for feature selection as well. There were a couple more questions, yeah. Um, as I said, the previous approaches used to work like that. Okay. Yeah. So the output, output is a network structure that overall, as a whole, explains the data the best. Now you can. Sorry. If there are two identical columns, there's that's a great question. There would be an edge. Yeah, yeah, I have to do that exercise to actually check what, what, what would be a direction in that case, right? But uh, I would, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, so, um, so we'll, as I said, so the P of X and P of Y will not be checked on the basis of conditional probabilities in this, while building the network. While building the network direction, we will not be building using those P of X and P of, P of Y, if you are identical, right? So I know it's a very simplistic example, but um, the question is which network, exp so the answer is probably that both are in the equivalence class. Both networks are the same probability and both are, uh, both are, so that network, both networks are in the same equivalence, equivalence class. Because P of X and P of Y, uh, if we flip, they are the same in this case. So uh, both network structures, explain the data equally well. Let me put it that way, right? It'll put an edge, it'll have an edge, but both the networks with both directions are in the equivalence class, which means that both are equivalent. There will be two networks. This is just one, one network. There may be other networks that are in the equivalence class of this network. So both of those networks will be in the same equivalence class. So in inference of causal relationship, yeah, again, great question. That's why we say that in the first lecture, I said that we cannot infer causal variation, causal relationship until we have specific interventions specified. And then as we keep on adding more interventions, the uh, basically the, uh, the, the constraints that are imposed by that, they constrain the equivalence class of networks that are possible. But in the extreme example where two things are exactly the same, I'll have to look and what, what would that lead to is something that I would have to look at. So the learning won't happen through that condition. The learning will be both, both networks are possible. A, B, and B, A are possible. And both are ex explaining the network structure equally well. If this is actually likely in the real world situation that given an intervention, that has been done, if both are possible, then it will still be in the equivalence class. But in the real world, that's why the number of structures gets constrained because this usually doesn't happen in the real world scenario. That's how the constraints play. Yeah, so um, I only have, I think 10 minutes. <clears throat> so let's quickly go to, but great questions, I think uh, help so we already talked about domain-based sanitization. 
and now we conduct inference, right? So we learned some network, but we also would like to learn inference, right? So basically we would like to take this network for some decisions, right? So what we do here is we look at, we, uh, we parameterize the network with conditional probabilities that are, um, uh, that are generating these data. So let's go back to the example of blood pressure, total peripheral resistance and cardiac output. Okay, let's just focus on this three node structure. We go to inference learning. We say, what is the probability I actually probably have done that? No, okay. So what is the, what if the um, cardiac output and TPR? What if the cardiac output is low? And TPR is low. I insert another evidence that TPR is low. What is the probability of blood pressure range? I mean, to a clinician, this is a, again a no-brainer that if low, to, to, uh, uh, low peripheral resistance, total peripheral resistance, and low cardiac output, which means heart is not pumping out enough blood, and the vessels are also dilated, blood pressure is anyways going to be low, right? This is a condition shock in ICUs. So uh, I can conduct this inference with error bars or without error bars. With error bars is just resampling based strategy, right? So um, you can see that it's very high probability that the patient is in shock, right? Low blood pressure being low is almost 100% probability. Again, which is something which we did not tell the model, it learned, it parameterized, because just having that edge does not mean that you can actually infer what is the, prob what is the conditional probability, right? So now you're actually conducting inference and the algorithms for inference are not going to go into details, but um, there's two types of inference again. In smaller networks, you can actually learn exact inference, which is, which is an approach which will give you some guarantees. But if you have very large networks, then it's difficult to do exact inference, in which case you can do an approximate inference. Both have their advantages and disadvantages beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but now if I said, okay, if total peripheral resistance was low, cardiac output was high. Heart is pumping out more blood. Resistance is, total peripheral resistance is low. What happens? Now you can see that it is not as high because now heart is trying to pump out blood, right? The probability of shock is not 100%. It's about 89%. There's, there is some patients, there are some patients who have a normal BP, maybe, I don't know, for whatever reason in this particular ICU, but you can see that that inference also um, happened, right? And then basically you set the total peripheral resistance to let's say normal and then cardiac output to be high, then the blood pressure is obviously going to be the higher range. So you see 75% chance of being high, okay? So these are things that would immediately make sense to clinicians being visual models. And then somebody was asking a question, how do you make sure that these models are actually deployed in the clinical settings. This is one way that we have found it to be useful, that we build models with clinicians, sanitize them with clinicians, and actually work through them with inferences like this, if this, if this does make sense, right? So um, I think I, I'll just, we have a full hands-on tomorrow, although this is just a demo. Hands-on is when you will actually do this, all of this, maybe on your own data, bring your own uh, questions. There may be some variations like, a mix of numeric and categorical data and how to deal with that, that can be dealt in more detail tomorrow. But what we have seen today is a very simple case of learning this kind of an AI model, which is a Bayesian structure. And obviously you can change visual settings, right? You can change layouts, make nodes sizes bigger or smaller. If you can't read the fonts, you can make them bigger or smaller. One another layout that I like to look at is this particular layout, because it gives me a sense of how the flow of information is happening and so on. Okay, so um, I think uh, we are about only five minutes um, short of the end of this particular session. So we'll just take a few questions and then go for the tea break.
Yep. Is there a way to? Within the learning of the network, you mean within the learning of the structure? I am not aware of uh, any such approach, which, uh, but how would you do that for, let's say, a large number of variables? Yeah, so I mean, we are, we have, the, the, the previous generation approaches do use conditional probability, right? Uh, if you know there's a mathematical relationship, there is a way to initialize structure with that relationship in place. But then how would we parameterize with that mathematical equation is not what I'm aware of. There's definitely a way of saying that these two variables, I know they, they, have, a, uh, they have a structural link in this direction. But to parameterize that link with the mathematical equation that you want to build in is not what I'm aware of. There could be a way, but I'm not aware of. Okay, so uh, uh, say for example, we have a medical data set. We do have outcome variable, but maybe we build a Bayesian network out of it. And we try to predict certain outcome. Is there a way to check how much accurately? Yeah. Yes, so yeah. So although these are structural learning algorithms, you can actually use the structure to predict outcomes. And uh, absolutely, yes. So these models are, as I said, general purpose models, you can use it to predict whether a certain patient is asthma, non-asthma, if there's an asthma node in that. And then using those predictions, you can actually do the same kind of setup that you do for other models where you have a test set. And on the test set, you look at what is the model performance indicators, sensitivity, specificity, ROCs, accuracy, and all of that can be done. So. Since Bayesian networks are, as I said, they are representation learning models, they're not the best suited to make predictions about a certain outcome, right? But you can use them, these as a step towards that, right? Because most of the computation is going towards learning the joint distribution and factorizing that into marginal probabilities, right? So if you have a very focused question, then don't go for Bayesian networks, okay? Then go for, whether this patient is shock or non-shock, use SVMs, use random forest, even linear models and so on, right? But if you are learning a represent, if you're going in unsupervised direction learning representation that gives you an overall picture of the data, right? With which you can reason with, then this is a good approach. And this can be used as a step towards the supervised learning as a next step, using maybe the marker blankets of that node that you are interested in as a predictor for that particular outcome. So, yep. Uh, while constructing these models, suppose we know some conditions about it so that the model don't have to learn on its own. Can we give on these things? Yeah, you can initialize the structure, right? So I, I don't, so I, we don't have a lot of options to, uh, for example, impose mathematical constraints. But at the time of structured learning, you can, uh, you can at least have these constraints about what is blacklisted, what is whitelisted. Structured learning, we didn't talk about these in a lot of detail, but you have, it says use expert knowledge by forcing or prohibiting edges. You can either force edges by whitelisting or prohibit edges by, by blacklisting. That's one way to constrain. But if you want to constrain it in more general manner, that is not good, yeah. At least in this framework. Okay, I think we can stop there. Um, um, and more in tomorrow's hands-on perhaps. <laughs>